question of the document so we could keep. Uh... Oh, yeah. So, should I click the. Okay. Yeah, I have already clicked it. Uh, continue. Great. Okay. So, I'm just recording this for posting. Okay. So, Timel, did you mean like uh, the same the question? Oh, no, maybe, maybe I'll just spend 15 seconds on that. I mean, if you, okay. you don't mind. Yeah. I'm going to wait for a bit for a few. What time is it? Okay. Shall we get started to now, do you think? Uh, sure, yeah. Yeah. Maybe you can first uh, say. Yeah, maybe I'll just uh, very quickly, uh, I guess, welcome to uh, everybody. Um, we we'll, want to make uh, this uh, as informal uh, as uh, possible. We had uh, uh, a very good uh, symposium uh, a couple of weeks ago, if uh, you missed the talks and if you're interested in uh, uh, hearing some of them, uh, the, uh, that uh, symposium website is linked from the seminar series website and most of the talks uh, uh, were recorded and uh, have been uploaded there. So you can access there. And I guess the second point is that uh, part of the goal of uh, the organizers for this seminar series is uh, that you know, with this uh, extraordinary time that we live in, uh, we could still have uh, continued uh, discussions and uh, uh, continue the uh, community that uh, are engaged uh, uh, in the discussion. So in that, uh, partly uh, a reflection of that spirit, uh, there's a, a Google Doc uh, that's also linked from the seminar uh, website, seminar series website, uh, which uh, contains, currently contains the questions that came up during the symposium. And our intention is to just keep on updating uh, the, that list. Uh, and you can, you know, uh, please uh, feel free to send us your, uh, your questions uh, that you think uh, are important for the field or if you object to any of the statements uh, that's uh, currently in the summary, uh, that would also be part of the discussion of the uh, community. So hopefully uh, the seminar series will uh, serve the purpose of stimulating some discussions and engaging the community as we uh, go through uh, this last stretch of, the, of this time. So thanks, thanks me. Yeah, thank you, Jimmy. Thank you all for coming. So today, uh, I guess I will chair the session. So we have two wonderful talks. And the first one is Professor Chong Jun Wu from University of California, San Diego. And he will talk about time reversal symmetry breaking pairing in iron tricogenite superconductors. So I'll keep an eye on the chat. If you have burning questions, yeah, that will help Chong Jun. So Chong Jun, it's, it's all yours. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, 
Today is my great pleasure to give a talk in this uh, seminar series. First, let me, let me thank the organizers, in particular, Chimio, for the kind of invitation. Today, I would like to talk about a possible time reversal symmetry breaking pairing in the iron chalcogenide superconductors. And this work was motivated by the experiment uh, um, of the upper measurement in the Peter Johnson's group. And let me introduce my collaborators. And Long Hui Hu was my um, uh, previous uh, postdoc. Now he's at Penn State. And he was the driving force of this um, theory uh, calculations. And Menzen, uh, he's a student at UC San Diego. The experiment uh, was done in the Peter Johnson's group. And uh, we are uh, his uh, theory collaborators. And Hongye, he was also a student at UC San Diego, and uh, he was a student of uh, Yi Zhuang's youth group. And here are some um, uh, references. Um, this is the outline of the talk. Um, first, I will give a quick um, introduction of the general relation of topological surface state and the unconventional uh, pairing symmetry. And after that, I will uh, recap the experiment results in Peter Johnson's group, and which shows that there's a time reversal symmetry breaking and this uh, gap opening in the uh, surface state of the iron, um, selenium, and uh, tellurium superconductors. And after that, I will provide a theory analysis and uh, propose a uh, time reversal symmetry breaking pairing and also the relation to the bulk magnetism. And finally, we will uh, show that this time re reversal symmetry breaking effect can still survive in the normal phase as a consequence of the phase of fluctuation effect. Uh, now let me um, introduce the background. Um, now, um, the celebrated example of the unconventional superactivity is the uh, D wave pairing state of the high TC equilibrate. The D wave, which means that uh, if I rotate 90 degree, the gap function I change the sign. Such a uh, non trivial uh, structure can be reflected in the uh, boundary state if you have a boundary along the one one direction and follow the trajectory of the quasi-particle scattering. If you run this uh, incident wave and the reflection wave, the gap function switch the sign. This means that this boundary has a topological kink, which is surprised uh, uh, the uh, gap function. As a result, the zero energy and drift mode will appear on this boundary and uh, is uh, this uh, theory proposal was by Charon Hu and uh, later on was experimentally observed by Laura Green's group. Um, the function symmetry is always an important issue of unconventional superconductivity. For the field of the iron uh, based superconductor, uh, this is, remains an open question after more than 10 years of research. And here I list uh, uh, a few of um, these uh, possible uh, pairing symmetries that was proposed in the literature, including this um, extended S-wave pairing and the competing S-wave and D-wave. And recently there's a, a very interesting work um, by Chimio's group. He considered a, uh, the multi-orbital version of um, make an energy of the helium 3B states uh, superposing of two different uh, uh, D wave gap function symmetries uh, such that uh, this uh, is uh, fully gapped. And uh, also in particular, in the literature, there are a few um, uh, gap function symmetries um, that break time reversal symmetry by superposing uh, two different uh, gap functions with a fixed difference of pi O2, uh, also including a paper uh, by myself. Uh, recently, the, uh, the iron, tellurium, and selenium superconductor uh, has attracted a great deal of attention. Part of the reason is 
it has a non-trivial uh, band structure topology uh, in the normal state. Uh, it's the because of the uh, tellurium atom has a stronger spin orbital coupling and is bigger, such that its pure orbital bands dispersion is large and the cross has a crossing with um, <coughs> band inversion with the d orbital band. And uh, uh, this results in a non-trivial band structure topology, and uh, such that they develop a, a single Dirac cone on the surface. And this structure has been nicely observed in experiments in the upper uh, spectroscopy, and also spin resolved uppers also see uh, have have seen this uh, spin texture. Um, actually, this normal state is not an insulator, but a metal. Um, the Fermi surface cuts both the bulk of uh, <coughs> a bulk band, have uh, the hole and Fermi pocket, and also cuts the, um, the surface uh, Dirac cone. And the surface Dirac cone, uh, when the temperature below the TC, the surface Dirac cone also becomes superconducting due to the proximity effect. So this uh, nicely realize the uh, proposal by Fu and King as to the uh, realization of a two-dimensional uh, topological superactivity. And recently, there uh, have been quite a lot of work um, uh, to study Majorana physics along this direction. However, the topological surface state of the iron, uh, tellurium, selenium, a superconductor mostly comes from the band structure topology in the normal state. It seems that it's not directly related to the gap function symmetries. It would be interesting if we can use this topological state to extract some useful information of the bulk pairing symmetry. And, and this is the, um, the, the question that I will address in the following of my talk. And next, I will give a brief recap of the important results in Peter Johnson's uh, experiment. And basically, uh, his group observed the uh, gap opening uh, in this uh, drug point, and I will explain why it's related to the time reversal symmetry spontaneously breaking. Um, so this is the uh, upper laser upper spectroscopy of the surface uh, state. Uh, from uh, this is a uh, normal state and goes to uh, below the transition temperature. So basically, uh, his group observed the two different gaps opening in the surface state. The first gap is not surprising, and it's just the uh, surface uh, superconductivity due to the um, proximity effect. And uh, they also observed the gap opening at the Dirac point, uh, also. The, uh, around the same transition temperature as the superconductivity. And this is not the superconducting gap because the drug cone is actually below the Fermi surface about uh, eight milli electron volt. And we can, uh, we later we also see that if the gap function doesn't uh, break time reversal symmetry, it will not leave this chroma degeneracy either. And these two different gaps actually has a, a very close relationship. And, and this is like, uh, like a data collapse. Um, if you plot the two different gaps, the Dirac gaps and the superconductive gaps on the same scale, and they uh, develop roughly speaking at the same temperature and their scaling also roughly speaking follow on the, on the same curve. And, if we uh, look at carefully at uh, the, uh, the gap opening at the gamma point, um, we can, because the gamma point is quite special, um, this time reversal pattern, it is itself. If the time reversal symmetry would be preserved, then neither the parity breaking nor the nail ordering could leave this chroma degeneracy. And the only way to leave this degeneracy is to break time reversal symmetry See if you, uh, since we don't have magnetic field, uh, applied magnetic field, uh, Z component of wise field or magnetization uh, could do the work. 
but a magnetization in the xy plane cannot. Uh, the, if the magnetization is in the xy plane, it can only shift the direct point in the xy plane. So the questions are, what's the origin of this wise field uh, or the molecular field? And second is that, can it provide certain constraints to the possible pairing symmetry in the bulk? And next, we will provide some theory analysis on the possible uh, <coughs> constraints to the gap function asymmetries. And before I move on, um, let me introduce a general mechanism towards time reversal symmetry uh, breaking pairing. Um, uh, if you have competing gap function symmetries, and generally speaking, they cannot couple at the quadratic level because there are different symmetries, but they often do couple at the quartic level. For example, this lambda prime term, we can convert two cool pairs to, to another uh, two cool pairs with different uh, symmetries. And uh, if this lambda uh, two is uh, lambda prime is uh, positive, they, by uh, minimizing the free energy and the relative uh, phase uh, should be pinned at uh, pi over two. And this is means that spontaneous time loss of symmetry breaking. And this is a older result um, in Figuris uh, review uh, paper. As, uh, as our application, uh, we applied the to a mixing singlet and triplet the pairing. And in this case, they also break time row symmetry uh, develop a 90 degree phase difference. And actually in the weak coupling theory and uh, this energetically uh, is uh, favorable because that is a unitary pairing. And in the BCS mean field theory, the free energy um, favors a unitary pairing. And please forgive me for a little digression uh, if this uh, this S plus I, uh, this P plus I S type uh, uh, gap function actually provide a nice realization of uh, Majorana fermions without uh, introducing spin of the coupling. For solid state system, the fermions electrons are often doubly degenerate. Uh, from a doubly degenerate from a surface to a single branch in my randomness, actually we need to reduce the degree of freedom by uh, one quarter. And this uh, P plus I type superconductor is a surface that develop spontaneous magnetization, which means that this degree of freedom is reduced by half. Then if you have two different domains, P minus S and P plus S, then on the surface, the domain boundary we are further reduce the degree of freedom by half. And then the Kyle Majorana can run across, uh, run along this boundary. And this is in contrast to the ordinary uh, method that you need to begin with a normal state, a single Fermi surface, which is often a uh, unit spin orbital coupling. And this is a purely a property uh, by superconductivity. Now let's come back to this iron-based superconductor in order to uh, check its possible pairing uh, symmetry. We first need to look at this uh, crystalline uh, symmetry. And the, uh, each iron atom, the point uh, symmetry group is D2D, and it is a axis of the fourfold rotary reflection axis. And the uh, selenium uh, atom, uh, is the center of the C4 V point group as a fourfold rotation uh, axis. And the inversion center is lies on the bound center of the iron iron bound. So overall, the symmetry actually is non symmorphic. Now we need to uh, couple this magnetization with the gap functions. Since the uh, magnetization is time reversally odd, the lowest order coupling uh, can be uh, written like this. And the magnetization along the z-axis is a symmetry um, using a group uh, language, group theory language is A to G. Then the gap functions, the, um, the product of the gap function uh, to gap function symmetries should contain this A to G. And then we check that the group representations that all the uh, possible gap function symmetries are allowed are here. And this A's, B's, actually there are some, uh, there are rigorous group theory symbols, but they might not be intuitive for uh, many um, P 
people in the audience. So loosely speaking, this A uh, means S wave like, B means D wave like, E means P wave like, is a rotation with respect to the uh, C axis. This G and U uh, refers to the parity, uh, even and odd. One and two actually refers to this even and odd. Uh, for the two-fold rotation, and the rotation axis lies in the xy plane. Yes. And then uh, to be more concrete, so we consider uh, we uh, uh, enumerate all, almost all the possible uh, gap function symmetries by considering uh, you have one unit cell, we have a pair of iron atom A and B, and uh, keeping these three uh, uh, electron orbitals. So the gap function symmetries actually has two uh, different, uh, three different parts. One is the angular form factor, then the matrix structure in the AB sub lattice, then another is the matrix structure in the in the orbital uh, channel. So, um, so the actual symmetry uh, might not be uh, might be looks quite different from the similar symmetry of the angular form factor. The actual symmetry is a product of the symmetries of the three different channels. And then in order to uh, apple uh, this uh, magnetism in this uh, magnetization spin channel and in the orbital channel, we still need a spin optical coupling. Then we can calculate uh, microscopically and uh, this uh, coupling constant through these uh, Green's functions. Uh, if you, uh, you add this uh, spin optical coupling in the T2G channel and uh, Lunghui, uh, he calculated, uh, for some representative gap function symmetries in these different channels, and that uh, you can get non-zero coupling between uh, among this, um, this uh, uh, magnetization and uh, time reversal symmetry breaking gap functions. And then um, let me address that such this kind of time reversal asymmetry breaking effect can also exist in a normal state as a result of uh, phase fluctuation. You know, for this uh, strongly correlated system, the superconducting system, they often have a fixed fluctu fluctuation region above the TC, uh, which means that the gap function magnitude is fixed by the phase is uh, fluctuating. We can model this using this XY model and J1, J2 as this uh, superfluid stiffness. And then if they are not coupled, they will introduce, uh, generate a Castellis Thalys uh, temperature scales. But now due to this uh, quadratic uh, uh, Josephson coupling, uh, we add this uh, lambda term. And this coupling will introduce a, another temperature scale, which is we call the phase locking. And depending on the coupling, which is a positive or negative, uh, if it's a positive, uh, the phase locking will uh, the phase angle will be 90 degree, the breaks time reversal symmetry. Otherwise, the phase locking will be zero or pi, actually is uh, often leads to a pneumatic uh, superconductivity. But now we just consider uh, the time reversal uh, symmetry breaking case. And uh, without loss of generality, we can using the renormalization group argument, we set the J1 to be one let J2 uh, smaller than, than, than J1. And then uh, the actual phase diagram, uh, the phase structure is determined by the T star, which is the phase locking uh, temperature scale, and also the T1, which is the KT temperature scale. So if uh, uh, these two channels, the superfluid density uh, difference is pretty large, and then uh, if we start from the high temperature in the phase one, which means normal, there's no superfluidity in both channels. If we cool the temperature, we first have a superfluid transition, which means that you have a superfluid in the first channel, but uh, the two channels are decoupled. And then you further lower the temperature, the phase become locked, you have a second superfluid transition. But if these two channels are nearly degenerate, and then this T star, you can see that it's significantly higher than the superfluid the, uh, temperature scale. So if you lower the temperature, we will first uh, uh, break the, the, the Eisen symmetry. Here is a time reversal to get a, a normal state. So the physical idea is that in this region, uh, we have a phase of fluctuation in both channels, but their relative phase is pinned. So they fluctuate 
um, as uh, together. And then as you further lower the temperature below the T1, and, and then they uh, undergo the superfluid transition to enter this uh, phase lock the superfluidity. And we also, um, uh, Hongye did the numerical simulation for the classical XY, uh, the, the coupled XY model. And we particularly look at this, uh, uh, the phase locking phase transition with Brix's Eisen type of symmetry. And it fit nicely with the critical exponents of the two dimensional uh, classical Eisen model. And then uh, this result might be useful to explain uh, at the beginning is a puzzle to us. Actually, in Peter Johnson's experiment, uh, he already see a small gap at the drug point, which is about the three electron volts at, at the TC. So this could be understood as a phase of fluctuation effect. Um, we should also have a normal state, which also break time also asymmetry. Um, and uh, another important issue is that uh, so far, I have introduced an intrinsic scenario I would call is due to the complex gap functions to break time loss symmetry. But there's another possibility that the surface, the iron impurities, uh, develop uh, a ferromagnetism, which would also work. But this action-seek mechanism, which is hard to explain why these two gap and the superconductivity gap and the drug gap are so closely correlated. So one possibility is that probably both the scenarios works. And I, I think that the, the intrinsic scenario, the complex gap function is a driving force, but it can be amplified by the, uh, the iron impurities. And this is the uh, summary of this talk. So, um, so they, we pro, uh, pose a possible time reversal symmetry breaking uh, pairing uh, in the iron uh, uh, Chalcogenite superconductor, and the result is motivated by this uh, upper experiment, which is saw this um, gap opening at the direct point, which means that time rule symmetry. And it also gives certain constraints uh, to these uh, possible uh, gap functions in the bulk. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Sunshu, for this very interesting talk. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I, I always. <laughs> Maybe I spent too much time. That's okay. Uh, so I guess uh, we can maybe spend a couple of minutes for some questions. So Daniel? Okay. Yeah, thank, thanks for your talk. Um, just one uh, quick question. You said yes. that your Dirac gap is observed to exist uh, at the superconducting TC. It's finite already. Do you know what temperature that Dirac gap vanishes at? I don't know. I uh, I think that uh, I asked the Peter, and uh, I guess it's very difficult to tell because you no, know, uh, it is kind of experiment issue. Uh, you always have some background. Uh, it's not easy to see that uh, when the gap exactly opens. If you move uh, significantly below TC, you can see. Uh, let me go to example. If you uh, look at the data here. Uh, there's always something blurred in the middle, um, so it's, it's not so easy to see that the exact temperature when the, tab, uh, the gap opens. But I'm not an experimentalist. <laughs> uh, I'm not, uh, um, uh, uh, you could ask Peter for ex uh, how he uh, uh, thinks about this problem. Okay, thank you. May I ask a follow-up question, Songjun? So, sure. uh, I understand correctly that a T star is where both the swimming gap and the Dirac gap uh, open. Uh, and you mean here? Uh, yeah, star. right. Oh, this is like a phase locking temperature. Uh, the, uh, the, it's a temperature scale. You have two gaps. Uh, they have the, uh, each, uh, each channel has its a phase. Uh, you can define a relative phase. Uh, you, you could have a phase of fluctuating but the relative phase is locked. And if these um, two channels, their superfluid the stiffness are reasonably close, actually the phase locking temperature scale is higher than the superfluid temperature scale. I see. Okay, I see two more hands up. So Lu, Lu Li first. Lu? 
Hey, it's Hongjun. Nice talk. Talk. This is Lu. Wait, thank you. Ah, right. Hi, Lu. Um, nice so, to see. So, yeah, a, a quick yeah. question and a comment. The yeah. quick question is, um, the experiments we refer to, it's Gengda Gu sample? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. They okay. Are, they All right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. The comment I have is, uh, in Gengda sample, yeah. when we try to measure the known spec, we observe a spontaneous known spec right below TC. Below TC? Below TC, right below TC. I Above see. TC, it's really hard to tell, but below TC, there's really pronounced spontaneous non signal. That suggests that time reversal seems to break it. Oh, and we also, nice. we also test iron silicon line without, uh, so different from Gunda sample, another compound. I see. And, and such phenomena does not exist. Okay. It, so at least to us, it seems that only in iron tender silicon line. We observe a spontaneous non fact in the supermapping state. Yeah, so that's our observation. Actually, I, I read a, it's a paper also uh, uh, published in PRB uh, like last year. Is that paper? Nernst, uh, yeah, I assume that's our paper. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I remember you, you mentioned you also saw some signature in the normal state. Is that, is that right? Uh, um, I, I, I don't recall any clear signature in the normal state. At least oh, we are not able to resolve. Um, there might be, but we are using the difference between the thermal power versus temperature and the, and the zero field signal versus temperature to subtract the background away. It's rather hard for us to determine any normal state contribution for these zero field components. Of course, the normal non signal has a large supermagnetic fluctuation regime, like what you are suggesting here. It's I just see. hard for us to, to determine whether or not there's a time is reverse symmetry breaking in this fluctuate region. Anyway, yeah, yeah just my comment. Yeah, but but uh, really Thank interesting you. story here. Thank you. So I see three more hands. Maybe you can just keep at least three. So Chimel, Pongcheng, and TC. So Chimel. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, nice talk, Pongcheng. Nice I, I had a Thank quick you. question. I, I guess we'll be hearing more in the next talk about gamma to Z and all that. But I, I just wonder in the experiment, uh, uh -huh. uh, Peter's experiment that you, you uh, mentioned, uh, is it focused at gamma point specifically or, or is it also looking along gamma to Z? Uh, yeah, I think it's a surface. They, they, they look at, they check the both the bulk and also the surface, you, they use the different light polarization, the S and the P for the surface state. This is surface state. Uh, if, the two, if you look at two dimensional momentum is as the gamma point. Uh, sorry, do, do you mean the Z is the electron pocket or is the, uh, the surface dimension? I'm, I'm, uh, I mean, I presume the bulk states also come into play in, in some way. Um, so Z is uh, I is guess a long my question is that in a bulk, I, I can go from gamma KZ equal to zero to Z KZ equal to, I guess, pi, right? Um, uh, the bulk state, uh, actually, uh, sorry, I, I didn't check uh, the, the bulk state uh, dispersion. Um, in the paper, I, I don't recall it has the KZ information, but I, uh, it, um, I, I only remember it uh, has a, uh, the laser operas, the uh, light momentum is rather small. Actually, it cannot uh, fully exploit the, actually it didn't say for me surface crossing. Mm -hmm. uh, but but the, for the, the, the superconducting gap, the, the gap near EF, is that supposed to be uh, the superconductivity on a surface or is that superconductivity in a bulk? Uh, that is being... uh, for, for this picture is a superconductivity on surface, but in the, their papers, they do have uh, the, uh, the, the opposite result for the box superconducting gap. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so, so I, was, I was curious, Chung Jun, I mean, so if you see this time reversal symmetry breaking, that means that you have some sort of ferromagnetic component. According to Lu just said, I mean, doesn't this mean that, uh, you know, since he couldn't see it in, in iron selenide, doesn't this mean, I mean, there's more, you know, a possibility induced by the iron impurities? Yeah, that, that, that's a, a possibility. Um, but the question is that uh, see uh, this uh, so closely uh, since two gaps if you um, 
uh, divided by their maximum value, they're almost the fall on the same curve. So if it's uh, due to the iron impurity, you would expect um, mm -hmm. the time reversal symmetry breaking would completely come from a different uh, temperature scale. So does, does he have a doping dependence? I mean, go to the overdope side to see, you know, because in the iron selenide, pure iron selenide, you know, there's no such effect, right? Uh, uh, I, I do know some experimental result, but I think that is uh, uh, unpublished. Uh, let, let's wait and see. And uh, okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, Thank, you. Group, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. TC. Yeah. Uh, hi. This is TC. So, uh, just to clarify yeah. something. So, um, in your model, so uh, are you proposing that in this case um, you don't need any? iron impurity, but instead the pairing symmetry itself can generate some kind of effective exchange field MC, right? Yes, uh, but uh, as a compromise, I would say the real life is something in between. We have both, but the driving force I would think is from complex gap function. Uh, it, uh, its effect might be small, but if you have the iron impurities, like like a you have an electric uh, magnet, right? You, the coil, the magnetic field is weak, but you have the iron, the soft iron, which can enhance this overall effect. So I, I felt that um, after all, what uh, uh, the Peter, what they saw is this pretty big gap, like uh, quite a few milli electron volts. Uh, that might be due to the amplification effect by iron impurities. I see. Yes, because uh, I'm just wondering, uh, does your model imply there's a critical MZ such that um, the by one or zero mode can be trapped in the in a vortex core, but like this MZ is intrinsically arised due to the parent symmetry, but not due to some. Oh, they, they, they didn't field. apply magnetic field, so it's different from the vortex experiment. They just the uppers you cannot add the magnetic field. Oh, okay, right. Okay. Yeah, so, so this is not the it's different from the STM type experiments. Okay, thank you. Okay. Great. So let's thank uh, Tongjun again for this great uh, discussion and talk. Um, we have a uh, second talk. So uh, I forgot to mention in the beginning. So we are, uh, so for the workshop, we we're trying to organize each uh, day with two talks on similar complementary uh, uh, topics. So for the second talk, uh, we have um, uh, uh, Professor Amit Kennego from Technia to give us a perspective from ARPES on this uh, topology in iron to learn selenium. So uh, Amit, oh, there you are. Oh. Hi. Do you start trying to share your screen? Thank you, Songjun. Yeah. Actually, Amit, is it okay yeah. to record? I'm not sure. Please go ahead. It's okay. Yeah, thanks. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Mitt. All yours. Okay. Can you see my cursor? Uh, I don't see it right now. Okay. So we'll try and try that. Okay. Okay. So first, I would like to thank the organizers for this nice opportunity. <clears throat> So I will try to convince you that there is indeed a bandit version in the system, although I guess most of you are convinced because there is a lot of evidence by now uh, of, uh, of, of both the surface, the direct surface state and uh, even some uh, bound states uh, in, the, in the cores of, of this material. So it seems like a topological superconductor. Uh, but uh, as you will see, it's actually it's quite surprising that uh, we can see a band inversion in such a band structure as seen in this uh, material. So just uh, to uh, make the name of the compound more friendly, let's call it uh, FST, okay? Uh, oh, there is some issue. Okay, so, 
this, this work is a collaboration uh, between the group of uh, Moit Randeria in uh, the Ohio State University, uh, Bing I Yan at uh, the Weizmann Institute, who did some DFT calculations for us, and myself. And the people that really did the work here is uh, our uh, Iman Shu Loani, who did uh, the ARPES uh, work, and uh, Tamagna Azra, who did uh, a very nice tight binding model that I will uh, show. And uh, I just want to mention that all the data we show uh, was taken at the Diamond uh, and Bessie synchrotron. Okay, so uh, the starting point is this uh, prediction by uh, Wang et al. from 2015 that uh, using DFT have shown that when uh, the, some of the selenium, selenium is substituted by the terurium, we get for some reason a much stronger uh, dispersion along the KZ direction. Uh, and uh, he predicted that uh, there will be a crossing between a, a very dispersive PZ band and the D orbitals that uh, form the pocket around the gamma point. And uh, one of these bands is supposed to mix with the PZ and, and, uh, and then uh, there will be uh, basically a, the, an opposite parity of the valence band at the gamma and the Z points, which is exactly what you expect from a 3D topological uh, insulator or a Z2 topological superconductor uh, insulator. Uh, so this was, uh, for us, actually, this was a very weird prediction because uh, at the time we were working with this um, compound and this compound is really extremely 2D. So it's very hard to ex expect something like that. But soon, uh, or at least uh, two years ago, uh, there were very nice demonstrations that actually were indicating that this is indeed a topological superconductor. Uh, the group of uh, Hong Ding and Shikshin showed very nice uh, uh, Dirac-like surface state with all, uh, and uh, they even showed that it's uh, spin polarized. And uh, soon later, they used an STM to show uh, something that looks really like a zero bound state in the core of, of the vortices in this material. And it's very, very hard to, uh, let's say, explain these features in any other way except uh, topological superconductivity. Uh, but wh why? Uh, it, this thing, this uh, result seems surprising uh, to, to see that it's uh, very informative to compare the RPS and the DFT predictions. So I think the first paper that, were, that was showing that uh, there is really a systematic inconsistency between the DFT and the RPS was the work uh, by Anna Tamai, where they showed it to to somehow fit the DFT band structure, you need to renormalize the bands by something which is between a factor of four and 20. Uh, uh, on top of that, we later on showed that the, the Fermi energies in this material are extremely small of the order of 10 millivolts. So they are so small that you can even at some uh, extreme samples think about this system as a BC superconductor where delta is really of the order of the Fermi energy. So uh, the DFT prediction seems to, they, they, for some reason, they are holding when you are thinking about the KZ uh, dispersion, but they are very different from the experiment when you look at the planar dispersion. So we decided to look more carefully, uh, to, to measure more carefully the band structure along the KZ direction. Uh, so th these are the samples we are using. These samples we grow at uh, my lab. Uh, I think that they are quite similar to other samples uh, that are used by other groups. For, for these experiments, we did a lot of, uh, we did very careful oxygen annealing to try to minimize as much as possible the excess iron, which leads to some uh, magnetism. Uh, and uh, all, all the data I will show is 
is taken for a x uh, equals 0 0.4 uh, substitution and tc of the sample is, is something like 14.5 15 kelvin okay so what we are uh, first I, I would like to show you how we extract exactly the band structure so this is a typical ARP scan at the 22 EV and you can immediately see these two all like bands uh, for each of these bands, we basically take cuts, many cuts at different energies. And from this uh, momentum distribution curves, we can extract very nicely, uh, just using a parabolic fit, we can extract the Fermi energies of these two bands. Uh, so here you can see one band, which is basically crossing the Fermi level. Uh, we call that band alpha two. And this, uh, this band creates a, a pocket around the gamma point. And you can also see alpha one, which is a pocket, which is a band, which is uh, approaching the Fermi level, but never crosses it. And it approaches to about uh, 15 to 20 millivolts from the Fermi level. And this is exactly the band that is supposed to mix with the PZ band. And now this is a very, it's a relatively complicated band structure because there are many pockets and many orbitals. So uh, when, when, uh, when we change the polarization and the orientation of the samples, we can get a lot of information about the orbital content of these bands, and these will be important. So for example, here you can see that just by switching the polarization, uh, we can completely get rid of this alpha two band, uh, which would be very useful for uh, looking at, uh, at this uh, band inversion. Okay, so uh, next we would like to see if we can see the surface state. So uh, all the data that basically was focusing on the surface states in this material was done using a laser, where the photon energy is very low and the momentum resolution is extremely good. Uh, this, the same was actually shown in the previous talk, data by Peter Johnson. Uh, but uh, if this is really a surface state, then it should be present at any photon energy and at any KZ, right? Because it's a, if it's a surface state, it cannot depend on KZ. So what we do here is we are looking at the top of this alpha one band at, uh, using a lot of uh, many photon energies. We scan here between 30 and 100. And uh, you can see that at, binding, at the binding energy of 10 millivolt, we always see some intensity. So this is an intensity which lies just above the top of this alpha one band. Uh, and the fact that we see it for any photon energy is encouraging because this is what you expect from a, a surface state. Uh, in addition, we see it's not dispersing. So we cannot, uh, you, in, in the raw data, it's very hard to see the, uh, this Dirac cone, but just by uh, taking the second derivative, you can see that indeed there is a faint Dirac cone-like uh, feature just lying on the top of this alpha one band. Uh, to show that it's not dispersing, what we do is we, we, we take uh, cuts at different energies and we look at the momentum, at the width in the momentum of these uh, uh, peaks. And you can see that there is also a, always a minimum, a, a minimal width to this peak, which is at about, uh, eight millivolts, and uh, we assign this minimum with the Dirac point, uh, which is actually in agreement with uh, uh, the work of other groups. So there is a surface state, and uh, the Dirac point is about eight millivolts below the Fermi level. Okay, so next we can now look at the dispersion uh, along KZ and try to compare it to the uh, to the DFT prediction. So to, to, uh, to do that, what we do is we, we, as I said, we vary the photon energy and using the simplest assumptions done in ARPES, we can relate this photon energy to the momentum normal to the surface. Uh, and what we find is that indeed this alpha two creates a pocket and there is some dispersion along uh, 
kV of about, the bandwidth is about 15 milli electron volt, as expected, very small uh, compared to most uh, metals, let's say. Uh, <clears throat> the situation is even worse for this alpha one. Alpha one is completely flat. So within our uh, momentum resolution, I would say that there is no dispersion along kz for this alpha one band. And, and to show how, and uh, to see how unusually this thing is, you have to, to compare it to, to this uh, DFT calculation shown here, where this alpha one is expected to have a bandwidth of about 600 milli electrons. So, so in principle, this flat band, this is exactly the band that it's supposed to go uh, to, to undergo this uh, band inversion. Uh, so th this raises the question of how can you get a band inversion uh, along KZ in a band which is completely flat uh, along KZ. Uh, so to try to understand uh, this, these features, the, the, both the flat band and the fact that experimentally, it seems that indeed there is a band inversion. Uh, Tamagna uh, composed a very nice kind of tight banding, which is supposed to be the minimal model to see this, uh, this effects. What we, uh, we keep basically three orbitals, uh, the PZ and the, uh, D, X, Y, X, Z, Y, Z orbitals. And we, we start from a renormalized uh, bandwidth, which we assume is due to interactions. What we, we, but we are trying to keep the ratio of the bandwidth of the PC and the D orbitals as found in the DFT. So assuming that the interactions uh, uh, start by renormalizing the bandwidth in a uniform way, uh, you can think about it in this way. Okay, so this is the this is the dispersion before we uh, turn on uh, a spin orbit coupling. When we turn a, a first a spin op orbit coupling uh, between the d orbitals, we get this splitting that is responsible for alpha one and alpha two. We use here uh, a spin orbit coupling which is very small, uh, in, in, uh, it's only eight millivolts, but because the bandwidths are so uh, narrow, this eight millivolts is, is not uh, negligible compared to the bandwidth and it plays an important role. Uh, now, uh, when, when the, uh, what DFT and the, same, and the model here tells you is that when the PZ band crosses these two, uh, D orbitals, it can uh, hybridize and mix only with one of them. Uh, this is a result of, of, the, of the symmetry of the underlying uh, crystal. And uh, what is the, the band which is supposed to mix with the, with the PZ is alpha one, as I uh, already mentioned. So now let's add the spin orbit uh, that, and allow it to mix the uh, P and D bands, and we already get something which is similar to what we see in the experiment. So the effect of the spin orbit coupling is uh, to open a gap and also to considerably uh, flatten the alpha one band. Uh, now, according to this model, at least, there is indeed a band inversion. You cannot see it in the dispersion of alpha one, but uh, you indeed get that the parity of alpha one changes when you go between the gamma and the z points. So can we, can we now experimentally verify this uh, idea? So to do that, we want to use the selection rules of RPS uh, because now uh, we expect that at the isometry points, the character of the alpha one will be pure. So we expect that at the gamma point, the, the band will be purely made of uh, D orbitals. And at the P, at the Z point, it will be purely a P orbital. Uh, so if we can somehow uh, arrange the experimental, uh, let's say, 
geometry in such a way that the RPS will pick, for example, only the D or only the P, we could maybe uh, see a difference in the intensity between these two points. Okay. Okay, so uh, this is a summary of the selection rules for uh, the symmetry. This is quite uh, involved. So for the purpose of, of, of uh, I think this talk and this experiment, we are measuring uh, along the gamma X orientation of the crystal and we use uh, vertical polarization, linear vertical po polarization. And in that case, this, the uh, selection rules are quite uh, simple. What the selection rules tells you is that, that only the DXZ component of alpha one should be visible uh, using uh, this geometry. So now if we, and if you really want to understand all the uh, selection rules, it's uh, I think summarized very nicely in, the, in this paper. Uh, so now we have, a, a, in a sense, a way or a prediction uh, that we can go and test. So we can now, again, vary the photon energy as we did before, but we are not just, now we are not just going to look at the position of, of, the, of the peak, but at the intensities. We measure only at normal emission and along the uh, gamma X, as I said, where we expect that the intensity will be higher at the gamma point compared to the Z point. Just because at the Z point, we expect the orbital character to be mainly PZ, which is not allowed at this isometry by the selection rules. Okay, so this is now the data. So we, we I show you basically an image which is composed uh, by, uh, that is stacking a lot of energy distribution curves taking at normal emission at different photon energy. And you can see here uh, that we managed to uh, basically uh, scan more than three uh, boolean zones along KZ. Uh, and you can also see uh, the EDC at, at the particular uh, photon energies. And you can indeed see that the intensity of this peak, the green peak, which uh, is the top of alpha one changes. And also the, it seems like the intensity of the surface state, which is uh, here uh, marked by this black line also changes. Okay, now when, when we try to extract a useful information from a plot like that, the main issue here is the normalization. Uh, because uh, when you do spectroscopy, if you look at features and energy, so then you are safe. But if you are trying to look at intensities, this can, all, this can many times be misleading because the intensity depends on many, many factors. Uh, we scan here the photon energy on a very large range. So the efficiency of the beamline changes, the cross section of the different elements changes. And uh, it's kind of risky to look at the intensity and it's much safer uh, in, in this case, at least to look at the intensity ratio. And, and uh, why is that? Because the surface state is two dimensional, it cannot depend on KZ. And it means also that the orbital composition cannot depend on KZ. Uh, so in a sense, by, by normalizing the intensity at the top of alpha one, by the intensity at the surface state, and we choose to do it at the direct point, um, uh, eight millivolts below the Fermi level, hopefully we get rid of many of these factors that strongly depend on the photon energy. So when, when, uh, when we do that, we indeed uh, find a very nice oscillation of this uh, normalized intensity. So what, I, what I'm showing here is exactly that. It's uh, taking the intensity at this green line, which is the top of alpha one and divide it 
by the intensity at eight millivolts, which is marked by this black uh, dot line. And you see the intensity is oscillating in such a way that it's always maximal at the gamma point and minimal at the Z point, uh, which is in good agreement with this prediction of the model because we know at the gamma point, the orbital, uh, the alpha one is purely D and at the Z point, it's purely P. So the fact that we see these clear oscillations, uh, which is uh, always maximum at the gamma point and minimum at the Z point, and we can follow that over uh, three brilliant zones, it's a very, I think, uh, robust indication of, of indeed a band inversion. Okay, so this is uh, the story, uh, just to conclude. Uh, I think uh, we, using ARPES, we can uh, reconcile some of these uh, seemingly uh, contradicting uh, facts. So indeed, there is a very strong signature of topolog topological superconductivity in this material, but the DFT is too simple to explain the situation. There is no dispersion in KZ. So it cannot just be a strongly dispersive PZ orbital crossing D. Uh, and this is due to this very strong correlations in the, this material. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, using this uh, simple model, we can, I think, ex uh, understand it. Uh, and uh, by, by looking carefully at the intensity and using the selection rules, we can even show that there is in the band inversion. Uh, so we think this is a very strong evidence of a topologically non-trivial bulk band structure in, in this material. And uh, I think the most interesting part here is that it shows that uh, the symmetry protected topological environments somehow survive this strong interaction. And this is a case where the interactions are really strong and, and completely change the band structure compared to the DFT. But in some mysterious way, the band structure somehow remembers the pair band structure and the, and the invariants remain, and the this topological in, invariants remain intact. And then this entire story is summarized in this uh, PRB paper. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amit, for this uh, very nice talk. Uh, any questions from the audience? Uh, Peng Cheng? I guess I guess I was curious. So I, I'm I'm not an expert on this in this area. So so does that agree with previous experiment or not? <laughs> previous description? Uh, you mean the if, if the data agrees yeah, with different? Well, I mean, I guess, I guess you're saying that there's no KZ dispersion. Right? I guess uh, Chong Jun was saying that Peter Johnson sees this, right? I mean, he sees the inversion symmetry and gap opening. Do you see the same thing? Or yes. Yeah, so, okay. So uh, we we see. You mean you mean now the magnetic uh, gap? So yeah, the, I mean the gap, uh, the gap, the gap at the Dirac point. No. So with with the uh, with this kind of uh, RPS data, I cannot uh, even try to see such a small gap. This is. So Peter, Peter's data was taken with a laser where you I get see, a very high resolution, but only at one point. So if, if, you, if you really want to learn about the properties of the surface state, maybe a laser is a, is a better solution. Here we mainly wanted to understand the relation or, or let's say the properties of, of the bulk. Oh, I see, I see, I see. So okay. This is the, in a sense a normal, a normal state set of data. Okay, thank you, yeah. But that might sorry just add to, from Potron. I guess the consistency is that there is the band inversion from this uh, analysis, which is what yes. Yeah, that right. aspect. In uh, that sense, it's very consistent. I agree. Uh, e Chen. Uh, yes. Uh, so so the first question I have is for for uh, for the for the calculation part actually. So when you say like uh, you. Uh, you constructed a, a minimal tight bending model. 
And after adding the SOC, like the bands, uh, some, one of the bands can hybridize with each other, the other one cannot. I just wonder. So because of the, in the end, you get such a flat band along K, KZ uh, for the alpha one band. I just wonder, in that calculation, did you just only add the SOC or you also include some other like uh, interaction effect to renormalize the band, uh, the alpha one band? No, no. So I, uh, the the renormalization of the bands is done uh, before before in the sense if you want including the spin orbit cap. So the the the, the fact that alpha one is is flatter than alpha two, it's just because of the spin orbit cap. There is no other. Uh, I see. I see. The fact that alpha two is is uh, flatter than the DFT prediction this is put by end, uh, assuming that this is a result of the strong interactions. I but see. Okay, thank you. So, and the, and the second question is, uh, so in, in the, so in this, in this slide, we can see the, the oscillation of the alpha one band uh, with the photon energy. I just wonder, so uh, if I remember correctly, the, the, the space group of, uh, of this uh, FST, Material is also uh, is is like tetragonal crystal lattice, right? Okay. Yeah, I, I yeah. just wonder, it, it, like this kind of oscillation in in different photon energies, uh, could that also like uh, be quite general in other KZ dependence in other uh, tetragonal, even if it's not iron based superconductor? Like for example, it's also a tetragonal crystal lattice, so it almost have have the same. Uh, planar geometry and if you measure it along gamma x direction would you also expect like because just simply because of the geometry so you can have the you similar mean, kind of mm -hmm. you you mean the the this is these are oscillations in the intensity not in the not in the dispersion yeah i, I mean the oscillation in the intensity because of the matrix element in fact so i just wonder if if, if we have other kind of tetragonal crystal even if it's not in in this family uh do you think that uh, could be a general case in, uh, no. in KZ dependent experiment? No, I don't, I don't think it's a general case. I mean, no, I, I'm not expecting that in a, in a let's say in, in a different uh, uh, iron-based superconductor where there is no uh, band inversion. But, uh, I, uh, but I also, I don't have data to show you that it's different in a different uh, system. But, I don't expect it. It will be very surprising if this is a result of the structure itself. I see. So, so the the, the main ingredients you have to the, the have the band inversion along the along this gamma z k z direction. Yes. I see. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jimel. Yeah, yeah. I mean, nice, nice talk. I, I just I have two questions just to make sure that I understand. Uh, to make sure I got the details right. Um, the, the first is. Um, uh, so uh, in this picture shown on the top left, alpha one is below the Fermi energy and alpha two is primarily above the Fermi energy, right? Uh, so so uh, am I understanding that this oscillation uh, concerns uh, the alpha one states? Only alpha one. Alpha two, alpha two is forming a pocket, so. Right, uh, you, know, you have a small pocket near gamma, but uh, uh, right. It's, uh, uh, yeah. exper it's experimentally, it. experimentally, you can never see the top of alpha two. It's, right. Yeah. So the the band inversion, the conclusion about the band inversion, is a statement about uh, alpha one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, also, also, according to the DFT, on, only only so alpha fine, one. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so that led me to the second question, which is uh, perhaps also uh, somewhat details, but uh, it might might be relevant. Um, so I can understand that the D states are uh, strongly renormalized by the interactions. Uh, and you know, there's a variety of uh, ways of thinking, orbital selective, et cetera. Uh, but for this DP inversion to end up to be nearly uh, flat dispersion, it seems to me that uh, there could be some fine tuning that's required for the dispersion of the yeah. renormalized PZ states that doesn't crash down all the way to very 
low energies below the Fermi level. And instead, it should also crash down to, as gamma goes to Z, the PZ dispersion should be approaching towards something within 20 MeV, et cetera, scale. And yet, I guess the picture, the question that's in my mind is that I would have thought that the interaction renormalization to the PZ states would be much more minimal compared to the interaction renormalization of the D states. And so uh, I'm, I'm back in my mind, I, I'm just wondering, now, of course, in the analysis, you put in the renormalized dispersion, so it's very nice, it comes out, but I wonder whether there's some degree of naturalness that one could uh, so, this question. Uh, I think in the, in, the, in, the, in the paper, there is an appendix uh, uh, showing the spectrum for, uh, for different parameters. So it's, mm -hmm. this is not exactly fine-tuned, at least in the term of when, when you think about RPS, I cannot see the unoccupied part. So even if the PV is very broad, as long as, as uh, its bottom is not very far from alpha one, alpha two, I will get the same result. Right. So, yeah, so I cannot really say experimentally uh, even what is, what is really the bandwidth of PZ. Experimentally, mm -hmm. you don't see PZ. You see a flat band and uh, its orbital comp component is changing gradually when you move between gamma and Z. We don't see, uh, I, I never get to see the, the P band when, when it's pure, which is more around the zone center, the gamma. Yeah. So I don't know what is the real band, which is the truth. I, mean, I think I agree with that. I think what seems to be happening is that, well, interaction renormalization is not just the bandwidth of the D states. It also changes the uh, Fermi energy with respect to uh, where it's located uh, with respect to the band. So, so there seems to be some requirement that the interactions should also push the Fermi energy to be pretty close to the bottom of the PZ band. And maybe that's natural, maybe not. It's an interesting question at least. Yeah, okay, I don't know. Yeah, thank you. Uh, but but like I just just chime in for that, you know, I guess, because yeah, then you, we, we need some sort of a orbital dependent shift because According to DFT, I think the bottom of the PZ band and then the XY band are quite mm -hmm. separate in energy. Yeah, no, no, we, there's no problem that I, we can give you the uh, orbital dependent shift. That that's uh, that's a big uh, thesis from wrong and uh, wrong you and myself. But uh, but I am I'm, I'm just uh, we never thought about the P states how that renormalizes, and I would expect that interaction would not affect the PZ states uh, that much, except that. The, the Fermi energy is uh, is being moved around, and so to me, it's a very interesting question: why the Fermi energy should be pinged close to the bottom of the PZ band? Uh, I see one more hand, Andreas. Oh. Hey, uh, I have a question uh, regarding just this plot you have been showing, where you follow the intensity basically of the. Uh, XZ, YZ orbital and show that uh, the intensity is lower at the Z point than at gamma. Now, have you made an attempt to actually also do the opposite to detect the um, PZ uh, orbital? So to look at another uh, polarization uh, property where you can actually detect PZ and see that kind of opposite uh, behavior, namely the yeah, I see what you're saying. at gamma. This is more. Uh, this is more complicated, uh, just because of the just because of the selection rules. It will. Uh, this will be very difficult to do. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm. I'm just asking because now, in principle, there is the possibility that um, at the Z point there might be some other orbital mixed in. I have no um, kind of suggestion what is actually happening, but I mean, let's suppose okay, that so, uh, x squared minus y squared orbital is stronger at, at the z yeah, point. But actually it could for also be at the same signature in your data. Yeah, yeah I, I think I see your point, but 
so at least, uh, okay, we know which orbitals are around. So actually this geometry is perfect for that because uh, you cannot see, at this geometry, you can only see the DXZ. So what, what I see, the, the fact that uh, the, the low intensity at Z is because of the missing part of, of, of this DXZ. Mm -hmm. So you just so, see the missing part of the DXZ. So but in, 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 in detect in, the uh, appearance of the PZ. Right, exactly. I don't oh, see the, yeah. the PZ I cannot see. I just normalized by some, by, by the surface state, which is some, maybe it's, maybe it could be calculated, but for me, it's unknown uh, mixture of these two bands. But, but alpha one itself, I only see the component, which is this TXZ in, in this geometry. And any attempt to see another band will, will, then I will face the problem you're raising because I will see, then I can see more than one orbital. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Great, any other question? I guess we can also, I see there was one question uh, in the chat. I guess that was for Chok Chung Jun's, uh, we can open, I guess, open up the floor for any questions. So uh, I don't know if Chong Jun is still, Oh, maybe he's not there anymore, sorry. Um, okay, anyway, any other questions? <laughs> um, if not, I guess let's thank both uh, Song Jun and Amit very much for, for their time and for this very interesting discussion. Uh, thank and, you. Uh, yeah. I, I can make a comment on the last question, uh, if, if time permits. Yep. So, uh, so I guess uh, the question of uh, mixing with the DXZ uh, has to do with uh, uh, which orbitals are allowed to mix with the alpha one and the alpha two. Now, um, the lower band, which is the alpha one, can mix with PZ, uh, but the lower band uh, is not allowed to mix with dx square minus y square or dxz minus y square. Those two can actually mix with the upper band. So uh, uh, the other ingredient in this uh, modeling that went in that uh, the, the band flattening is because of SOC induced uh, thin orbit splitting does not work for uh, the dxz uh, dxy or the dx square minus y square orbitals. Uh, so if we if we admit the possibility that this is a band inversion with dxzyz orbitals with a dxy or dx square minus y square, we then have to grapple with the question of then why is the band flat? Uh, so that was my uh, two cents on uh, that. So so can I just add? So even though you cannot see. Uh the XZ band, do you still see a peak even though it's weak? So meaning that the band position is still there? Uh, we never see another band uh, crossing into the field of view, if that's what you're asking. So, so, so I mean, when the intensity is low, say around the Z point, do you, you still see, a, see a, a, a weak peak due to the residual XZ uh, spectral yeah, weight? Or, I think you can see it here, uh, for example. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, if you look at around 44 EV, it's uh, it's not zero. Uh, there is some background. Uh, so I guess also the selection rules are not perfect. So, but uh, there is a very significant variation in the intensity. So, so could I just uh, add a stuff along this direction? I think during the symposium, um, there was a talk by Pen Zhang, uh, who used to be at IOP now at uh, in Tokyo. And uh, I had the impression that he, he was also saying that in uh, ion uh, selenium um, turnium case, uh, as opposed to the lithium 111 case, that what is seen in the bulk spectrum from gamma to Z uh, is quite flat. Uh, and uh, and I since they are not here, uh, time zone doesn't allow. <laughs> I, I, I was just wondering, uh, Amit and uh, uh, 
uh, and everybody else, anybody else. Uh, uh, this um, nearly flat alpha one, is that also seen in other APES groups data? If you don't mind, uh, comment. For, for, the, for, for, the, for this system, for the FST? Correct, yeah, like near 50-50, which is what you're doing. Uh, so I think, uh, I, I don't know if this was addressed, but if you look at, uh, we, actually we checked that. So me, different rules measure a different photon energy. Mm -hmm. Usually okay. not systematically, but if I collect all the data mm -hmm. from other groups, I think we always see the position of the top of alpha one more or less at the same place. Mm -hmm. So it, this can move between, let's say 15 and 20 milli EV below the Fermi level, not, not, okay. not more than that. But the observed uh, bandwidth is very narrow uh, for gamma to Z. So, so for, that, for, for that, they would have to measure at different photon energies. I see. So, so the it's, point that it's, you've it's, done, you've done a systematics of a wide, wider range of uh, photons. This is because I was looking for that question. Usually, okay. if you, yeah. So. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So with that, I guess we will conclude the, uh, the seminar today. Thank you all very much for coming. We have another one in. <laughs> good, good to see Goodbye. you. Amit. Yeah. Yeah. Thank Bye. you. Amit. Thank you very much. I guess this is sort of natural. <laughs> we promised to finish when? Uh, 12, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, Anyways. it was good. Yeah. yeah. A lot of, lot of discussions. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Jenny. Bye. Yeah, bye.